Hello, Hello and welcome you. to the Ladies Tale Podcast. podcast. Because, I mean, we would be with Miss if we didn't put this on the Ladies Tale Podcast, right? And we'd be like, why did you do this to her? That's <laughs> messed up. And it, it would be totally true. So Ladies Tale Podcast is for our, never mind, I'm not and, even going to explain it's it. for people. For people? For people. For people. For people. So what is, and I thought ladies for the animals? <laughs> no, for other people. <laughs> for other, okay. So if you're the the and I thought ladies, you're I'm other Jade. people. I'm Jade. And I'm Alona. I'm people and other people. Um, okay. Wait, does that even work? I don't. I don't think I don't so. think that landed. I think that fell flat. I really flat. really think it, it fell flat. Like, Let's move like on. you had a cake in the oven and then you opened the door and then you, and then you slammed it shut. It was like whoosh. Flat. Like, go for something. Okay, right now, thank you. We can't, no, we can't because apparently something we have a photo shoot. Apparently, out loud. apparently, there's a photo shoot happening, y'all. No one told us until like today, and we were like, Excuse me, excuse me, you know, you know, it's a pandemic out here. Everybody can't wait. Oh, sweet water, guess who's on a diet? Water, yay! Shit. All right, so we want literary life guide to pop poetry. That's yeah, there's a segue for you. I said we don't do them on the show, and I thought divorce was bad with other life lessons, and I thought being grown up was easy. And it's only on me, a memoir and verse, all available on audible.com, read by the wonderful Joe Sands. All right. And we have co-hosts. Yep. Co-host. Hi, I am Tanya Todd. I'm an author and actress and podcast host from Las Vegas. She forgot to say you can find all our books on www.andrethought.com, right? You did I that. did forget it, because you know, I forgot. Y'all, it's all right, now we have late or early. Now, wonderful well, guys, would you like to introduce yourself? Is that me? Yeah, I'm, I'm not catching a lot of it. Sometimes the audio breaks up, but I'm Gisela Rowe. I'm here in London and um, we have a radio station called Audiobook Radio. I produce audiobooks as well. So I'm kind of audio mad. In fact, I, you know, just constantly listening to things, making audiobooks, doing a lot of poetry anthologies and short story anthologies, as well as. It's a pleasure. I just listen to lots and lots of audiobooks and love it. Wow. Yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah. You do the same thing. You listen to lots and lots of audiobooks. I do. I do. Okay. So, how did you get started, first of all, even thinking about doing an audiobook radio show? Audiobook radio just seemed like a really good idea. And initially, we thought it was a good commercial idea, but it didn't pan out that way because the original kind of I can't say we had a sort of business plan per se. We kind of roll with things, but we thought it would be women of certain age, like myself. And therefore we had um, potentially a couple of sponsors lined up who would, you know, they were kind of doing niche products aimed at women of a certain age. But unfortunately, it never really found that market. I mean, we do, we have seem to have male and female. We have all age groups. We don't particularly have any one sector. And something like on, like we we have a radio station, audiobookradio.net, but most listeners we get from uh, streaming services like TuneIn, where we have, I think, 27,000. And uh, so it's not the kind of numbers. It's great for audiobooks, you know, but it's not the kind of numbers that would appeal to advertisers. So it's turned into a bit of a mission of mercy. Um, and because we get some really nice emails from people who are partially sighted or blind, uh, people who are even dyslexic. And... Uh, we just carry it on but it needs sort of some fresh energy and it needs a lot more kind of time devoted to it to kind of it needs a facelift right now actually but it's still worth listening to because it's just got so much great content you know there's so many interesting people and ideas that come across you know we have a slot called alternative radio which is very much um about social justice and it gives a platform to people who don't get a lot of media attention and deserve it, you know, because they are talking about social justice for all and that's not very popular with mainstream media for obvious reasons. So um, a lot of women, a lot of Afro-Caribbean poets and authors and speakers, uh, 
It's kind of across the board, though. It's a stripped and stranded schedule, which I don't know if that's the term you use in the States, but it just means that at the same hour every day is the same genre. So like 12 o'clock, there's plays, one o'clock, it's an author interview, two o'clock, there's poetry, etc. cetera. The eight hour schedule repeated three, three times a day. So it kind of varies with regards to um, the content. So poetry could be like a London poetry slam. It could be classic poetry. It could be a well-known poet reading their works. You know, it, it varies, but there'll always be poetry at that time. So um, the question, though, was why or how we started it. And, uh, yeah, there's not really a good idea, good good answer to that. It just <laughs> kind of evolved, yeah, it happened. Like it it kept on, just keeps on keeping on. You, when you say that it could use a facelift. What do you mean by that? What kind of boost do you need? Well, it needs lots of new material, lots of kind of, you know, there's just so many great podcasts out there and they often don't get like lots of outings. You know what I mean? Like you do your podcast and it's on Podomatic or it's on this or it's on that. But, you know, a lot of people would welcome having it on a radio station on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And um, it needs time and energy to kind of like find those podcasts that you, you know, are really a good fit for us um, as well as, uh, you know, just organizing that really. There is a plethora, isn't there? There's so many great podcasts. Yeah. And we could have a regular slot of, you know, somebody who does a regular podcast who wants it on audiobook radio on a week on a weekly basis, ideally. So if someone wanted to connect with you to see if their material was a good fit for your station, what how would you want them to go about that? Well, the most important thing is listen to the station and if you know because we have people who sometimes contact us and you know like they contact us with music and we don't do any music so mm -hmm. have a listen to the station and if you think it's somewhere you'd like your material to go out on then uh, on the station there's a contact us button uh i think it's just info at audiobookradio.net but it's contact us and it just, you can do it that way or just directly to info at audiobookradio.net. So before you started with audiobook radio, did you do a, have, a, did you have another career? And if so, what was it? Oh yeah. My, um, when I was a teenager, I started working in TV and I did that until 2010. So, um, that was very varied. My first job was for Italian TV, which is why I speak Italian, even though it was a program. It was a great idea for a program, actually, which uh, I tried to kind of get British broadcasters interested in, but I never could. But it was, um, you know, here in the UK, we have a lot of, just like everywhere else in the rest of the world, we have a lot of American input, but we don't get much European. And this program, it was sort of coordinated in a studio in Rome, and they had these crazy kind of anarchic goings on. Like there was the, they were called the Sorella Bandieri. And they were these drag queens that were fantastic. Have you heard of Roberto Benini? He actually won the Oscar for, I think, Life mm -hmm. is Beautiful. Anyway, right. this was the first thing he ever did. He was like a struggling comic, you know, just coming out. He was in the studio doing lots of kind of both kind of, skits as well as lots of sort of physical comedy and because he's he's really talented I have a feeling he might have a background in a circus as a clown or something because <laughs> he does a lot of that kind of comedy anyway so all that was happening in the studio and then they would say okay let's see what's happening in London let's see what's happening in Paris let's see what's happening in New York it was just those three places in fact Isabella Rossellini it was her first gig ever and she was the New York correspondent that's how she met Scorsese and you know etc anyway so she did New York and then the guy I worked for Michel Pergolani he did London I was a slave on the production basically um, and it was just really fun and then they'd have roving reporters around Italy so if there was I don't know art gallery or fashion show in Milan or San Remo is a annual music festival you know whatever so they would just be all these different things happening and then they'd have guests in the studio as well and it was called L'Altro Dominica which literally means the other Sunday the alternative Sunday because on the main station 
you know, like imagine it's like, not quite like BBC One, BBC Two, but like the kind of, the main station is Rai One and they would have like this sort of Ellie, Ellie is like light entertainment, this sort of Ellie spectacular with the dancing girls and you know, all of that. And we would, that's why we were the alternative Sunday. And it had a huge cult following. It was a really popular show and it was just such a great idea. And I just thought it would be good if we could do something similar, but, you know, concentrated around Europe, you know, because obviously there's loads of English speakers in every European country, but you could also share content and have people who speak other languages doing reports from London. But anyway, didn't take off but um yeah so that was as a teenager that was my first job I um I had a choice should I go to university or should I start working for this tv show which just sounded so much more fun so I did that and then um I continued working in tv but in British broadcasting well, that's an excellent segue there you you said reporting in the UK tell us about your time with the BBC uh, the BBC was actually a lot, lot later. I never, you know, in those days, it sounds really strange now, but in those days, women in front of camera were kind of auto cuties. You know, they just mm -hmm. read stuff. They didn't have a lot of profile or control or influence on the sort of programming. And presenting wasn't something or anything in front of screen wasn't really something that I considered you know I wanted to produce I wanted to kind of you know be in the hot seat and make things happen and it didn't seem like that was a possibility then I'm talking about like the early 80s you know it was the 70s as Italian TV so um, consequently I kind of avoided anything front of camera and regretted it because you know look at the control that presenters in front of you know front of house entertainers have but uh, yeah, so I worked in TV and then in 2002, God, I'm really good with dates today. I'm not normally. <laughs> um, so 2002, I started working for BBC as an entertainment reporter. And that was like a lot of fun. It was news, which was really different. Like if I had discovered news kind of 20 years before, I would have stayed with news because it's, you know, the adrenaline goes, it's, it's just, it's a lot of fun. You know, you've, you have to make deadlines, you have to be really, really quick and snappy with it. And there's, you know, and obviously you make mistakes, but you don't have time to go, oh, I wish I'd done this, I could have done that, I did it, because you're on to the next report. And I like that kind of um, speed and that sort of not dwelling on things, just like, okay, done that, next. Yeah, like I would write, adrenaline. I, yeah, I mean, I would be writing what I was going to be saying in the taxi on the way back. And, you know, it's just like, it's just a constant. Every day you've got to do another report and every day you're kind of, you're really busy. It's full on. And that's, um, yeah, I found that a lot of fun. But by 2002, I had uh, three kids and that was never going to happen. I couldn't really sustain it. You know, it was just, something that wouldn't really allow me to you know wasn't compatible with having three kids really so did you find any success behind the camera then yeah well by success I mean I managed to earn a decent living yeah I was a um I sort of started as a production assistant, then I was a researcher, then I was both a location manager and production manager and then I was a producer and I worked in a lot of different fields. Um, in fact, one of the first jobs I did in 1980 was on Raiders of the Lost Ark at Elstree, which again, I was kind of less than slave on that, I would say. But either way, it was, um, it was fun. And it made me realize I never want to work in movies because you just a cog in the wheel. and There's no way you have any influence on anything that's happening. Um, but that was enjoyable. Um, I worked on a lot of music programming. There was quite a cult pop show in the UK called The Tube. You should have a look because it was like we had everybody on from the Stones and Bowie through to, I mean, just literally oh, wow. anyone and everyone. And that was a weekly pop show on Channel 4. Um, 
pre-Channel 4, I did a few sort of documentaries. But I think the problem was before we had Channel 4 in this country, because Channel 4 was sort of formed in order to give independent production companies a voice, you know, and give them work, basically. And prior to that, you know, we had BBC and ITV. And they were pretty much a kind of closed shop. You know, it was very difficult to get work with them. And the kind of work I, like, I didn't want to be in an office. And basically the only kind of gigs I was getting was being in offices, you know, like kind of planning the shoot for everybody else who would go on the shoot and you would be stuck in the office having, you know, booked the tickets, made the carnage, sword that they've got, you know, somewhere to stay and all the locations were pucker and et cetera, et cetera, you know, but you, you know, it wasn't considered that you wouldn't go out with them because they were small documentary film crews that had like literally camera sound director end of. So, um, yeah, and opportunities were a lot more limited. I remember every job I applied for, you know, would come back Mr. as if my name, you know, it was like people wouldn't be able to pronounce my name. They wouldn't. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like it is now. They were very limited opportunities for women of color and um but I can see in the light I don't look like I'm of color but anyway <laughs> uh, so I um yeah so when channel four came along it just kind of opened it all up you know there was I worked on quite a few documentary series I uh, I just got lots of gigs and it was just absolutely brilliant. So prior to that, because I didn't want to be in an office, I kind of tended to work mainly on pop videos and a few commercials, but mainly pop videos. And I did loads of them. Probably the best known is like the Human League. Don't you want me? You know, I can't believe it when you say that you are leaving. Don't. It's quite well known. <laughs> it might not be that. It might not translate. And I think with my um, limited singing ability, it might <laughs> actually be even familiar, but it's quite a big tune. Now, oh, I no, I recognized it immediately, but I love it. Did music. you? <laughs> I'm liking you a lot more, Tanya. It's Tanya. It's Tanya with an O, it's, isn't it? Yes. Okay, does everyone do that? They say Tanya all the time. Well, usually people misspell it. They spell it with an A. Yeah, but do they also say it that way? Only if they're spelling it incorrectly and it's not Tanya. Um, but I don't mind Tonya, I don't mind Tanya, but really it's like the three syllables. The way you say it is correct. Good. They always say <laughs> people's names correctly. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> so Tanya, you use I, all the syllables you know that's that's important <laughs> so um no Tanya, i was gonna turn it over to you because we have been chatting with gazella because she was the what our, oh 120 something whatever she was the hardest question that we, she was the hardest interview we ever we got ever to this day to this day what I, I, well, made it just, difficult Oh, they just popped off some crazy questions in the middle. I mean, they they, no, it was they matched what was going on. And we so just like she had she could get she, there. So we have, just in case anybody doesn't know, in the first book, and I thought divorce was there with other life lessons, we have another chronicles in Hail Force. And nobody, because we were doing podcasting video, nobody, nobody really connected that we were uh, African American. And so Gazella said, so I see that you have another chronicle in Halewood as a as a um, poet. So that must mean that you're African American. And how does that relate to the success that you're having compared to your Caucasian, uh, Caucasian, counterpart. Caucasian counterparts? And we were like, you said what with the who now? Please <laughs> <laughs> understand that we have done over one hundred interviews. So yes. we were like, we're ready for any question, and pretty much. People ask us questions and we didn't even have to think. They just popped, the answer popped into your head and that's what you said. Because you, you, you said it so many times. And then she was just like. And then she said that. And I was like, well, there's just no answer for that. And we were just like, with the what, with the who now? And we were like, okay, all, all right. Um, we have an answer First for of that. All, we have an answer for that. We, yes. we do. Where we can do. people find that interview? 
<laughs> well, no, I, I, they will never find that interview. There's a point to this. <laughs> And on our website. You did a really good job with it. I don't know what you're bitching about. You definitely <laughs> job. No, you did a great <laughs> job. It was just, it was just that moment where I, it was like, okay, for it us, was, it was so obvious, right? It's so obvious when you're talking about another chronicle and hair and we're talking about like Kiki Curly mixed with mixed chick swirly. Like it's very obvious that was like. Who we are but nobody made that connection at all and over and then we would never thought that it would go there and then when you're doing a hundred and you've done over a hundred interviews at this point you just assume you know the answer to every question don't be overconfident y'all that's what it taught us never and be overconfident that question popped up and there was a follow-up question to it i don't even remember that i just I remember did. the first question and i Ooh. went first of all that's a great question <laughs> yeah first too like, wow She's observant and oh my goodness there's no answer to that <laughs> there is an answer but it was just like we there's no like pre-recorded answer in our heads for this, but it did teach us from then on that whenever we go on anything in the UK, we are super prepared. We write down, we, we back through all of our stuff. We look for all the points where it was like, oh wait, this could be interesting. That could be interesting. We go back through our website, we go back through our, through our, um, our other interviews. And it's actually been great because most of the times when they ask questions, it's normally about something that will happen way back in the past. It's like this obscure like a, fact that we said yeah. five years ago. Yeah. And then they're like, so did you, how do you feel about it now? And we're like, oh, we're prepared. Cause we're Bella prepared. taught us, you need to study. I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So that's not, and we, we thought to ourselves, that's not just a, a saying that the British, like what Americans think, like British people are always saying, like always be prepared. We were like, oh, they're just being stereotypical. We were like, oh, this might be a thing. You know, it's so funny because I was on the Mike Burton show last year and he pulled out some questions like, man, he read like every bio I've ever posted anywhere oh. because I don't even remember putting anything out there about these things. There's no way I could have prepared for those questions. And so maybe it is a UK thing. It's a UK. That's why you're the every standard. Time. <laughs> every, every time. Every podcast, every TV show, every, every time. Every blog. Every time. Every time. And you're like, all right, now I got you on this one. No, mm -hmm. This has never happened. I've been again. preparing for four months for this interview. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you guys come back. I'm Tanya, sorry. go ahead. I was just saying, we, we've known her since then, and we stayed in contact since then. It's because been a while. anybody that asks those questions, we, you, that's someone you have to know. <laughs> you want this person in your life. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you so, want to get to interview you, Tonya? Oh, no, you're still interviewing me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll set that up afterwards. All right, good. I have a lot of friends who are involved in the voice world, and last year they had kind of an explosion because we couldn't do a lot of things in person. I'm wondering what last year was for you. On a professional level, it hasn't actually changed very much. I mean... We've got probably some better voice actors who we previously couldn't afford, who are now willing to work for us. Um, mainly, though, two in particular who, you know, are really well known and they just say they love our material. So they're always willing to do it because we, you know, they're quite quirky short stories. They're, they're not really mm -hmm. well known people. I mean, sometimes it's like well known short stories like oh, Henry or, you know, um, Edgar Allan Poe or whatever but we have a lot of um, short stories that you know authors that you know the art you don't you just when you read the quality of the work you don't understand why they aren't really well known because they're great short stories and you know I'm talking about American and British primarily we've done quite a lot of European stuff as well but it's primarily American and British and um you know just brilliant short stories so i would say it's been more productive than you know the years when we were you know you're out and about you're doing things so right if you're not doing anything it's like well you might as well work and fortunately i enjoy the work you know it's like not a great hardship to read some more poems or to listen to more you know edit more <laughs> stories or whatever so yeah i mean and it's brought out the inner slob, as you can see, no makeup. Um, <laughs> but at least I'm dressed, you know, because I went out and played netball. Because normally I'm in pajamas 24 7, and often the same pajamas most days. 
Um, <laughs> I brush my Wait, teeth. Tell us about I... netball. What is netball? Okay, so netball is in this country, in the UK, it's primarily a girls game. And I qualify that because in Australia and Jamaica and lots of places, it's very mixed. So guys do play it. But in the UK, it's a girls game that you tend to get taught at school. And there's seven people on each side. And as with basketball, you are trying to shoot a hoop. But there's a designated circle, kind of semicircle, from which you can do that. And there's only two people on each team. So out of those seven, two, the goal shooter and goal attack, are the only allowed, only players of that team allowed in the circle. And then the opposing team have one person each marking them, which is the goalkeeper and goal defence. So in that semicircle, only four people are allowed in. And they try and score by getting the ball through the net but only within the semicircle. They can't shoot from anywhere. Okay, then, so no three-point shots. <laughs> no, none of that. And uh, it's meant to be a non-contact sport. You know, you're not meant to be hitting or touching or sort of pushing and barging anyone. Right. And you, the other players are all designated a certain amount of, so there's, it's uh, three sections to the court and certain players are only allowed in one section certain players are allowed in two sections and one player called the center is allowed throughout the court but obviously not in the semicircles so uh it's an unusual game because i don't know any other games where everybody has a particular place where they have to be and they can't you know i mean it's very different from the football offside rule but where they are off you know, mm-hmm. we call it outside, but they um, are kept within this designated area according to their position. And uh, it can be quite a fast game. You can get sweaty, which for me ticks the box. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy, mm-hmm. you know, it's a team and all the people I know well. Um, and unsurprisingly, I'm the eldest on it. Most people <laughs> are a lot younger playing netball. We played now a team that were all 20 something and one. But uh, yeah, no, I really enjoy it. I played, um, I played at school. And what position do you play? I, I normally play goal attack, but I was playing goal defense today, which is quite different. But it varies. I, to be honest, I do play most positions. I like that. Yeah, that's good. It sounds like it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. It is. I don't know why it never really, I mean, I guess the UK must have insisted it go to the Commonwealth, but I don't think it ever got beyond. (laughs) And uh, yeah, which is a shame. But in fact, we've now got netball over the last few years, we've had netball on TV, there's been netball sponsorship, there's been a World Cup of netball. I don't think it's in the Olympics. I don't think so. Um, it might be possibly but I don't think so because it's not really it seems like we would have heard about it more yeah just a little bit and I mean I mean I'm gonna be honest when you said netball I was just like oh that must be the English way of saying basketball and I just right like like, soccer and football right (laughs) yeah right you kind of like when she's like I'm putting you down in my diary I was like oh that's not oh wait no she means like like, right Because you were like, I'm so in her personal life. She she writes it all in her diary. Yes, there you go. She told me, she told me. It's okay. I'm not mad at it. Hang on a second. You're telling me you don't use diary? No, we don't call it a diary. Yeah, a diary is like we we're it's like our journal where we put our personal feelings. Okay, yeah. I mean, in fairness, dear diary. Yeah, we have that too. We have yeah. two. And so that's basically where we use that. And then you're like, no. And I'm like, right, calendar. She's putting us on a calendar. Calendar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. So that's what I thought. Yeah. There are quite a lot of uh, differences, aren't there, in the language? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, Tahani, did you have any more questions? Because um, I feel like I'm, we're finished with our questions. I know. I, 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 I do want to ask really quickly yeah. what are the MOBA awards? What, what was that? So the MOBO Award started in 1996 and 
it stands for music of black origin. And at the time, it's obviously hugely different now. But at the time, we had some successful UK artists. I mean, black American artists would come to this country, be promoted, and they were, you know, still very successful as they were in the States. But homegrown talent was kind of treated more as a novelty. So, you know, you might possibly get a three singles deal from a record company, mm. but you wouldn't get a three album deal, you know, and it was more, let's just, you know, release it. And if it becomes a hit, great. But there wasn't the kind of promotion. We wouldn't no have support for it. No, no marketing, no real um, spend. And it was similarly reflected in the media. You know, you would always get um, I think Hello magazine wasn't out then, but it was shortly after. But there was lots of, you know, those kind of magazines, newspapers and um, events that would happen. You know, you would not see a black face. That just would not happen. So unless they were American. But as I say, homegrown talent was never really taken seriously and there was never really an investment. And it was a crying shame because we had lots of really good, strong homegrown talent. And so Mobo was partly trying to address that and also partly just a celebration. You know, it was like a fun night out where you could get dressed up and, you know, enjoy yourself. It was dominated initially by American artists because we needed TV deals, we needed sponsorship, we needed, and those American artists were the ones that sell, had the profile, etc. Mm -hmm. We obviously featured British artists, but all I'm saying is, you know, like we had Jay-Z, we had, um, you know, way back Destiny's Child TLC. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a lot of big American names on the show. Uh, P. Diddy, uh, I mean, just loads of them. And so basically it was an award show to celebrate I mean, it sounds odd, music of black origin, because all music is of black origin. But the name Stark and Mobo was, yeah, it was a good name. And... Oh, she froze. Oh, okay. uh, it was the best single, best picture. But we had a couple of, like, Lifetime Achievement Awards, you know, that went from people from, I don't know, B.B. King to um, Anita Baker or... No, Janet Jackson gave her that award, but I can't think anyway. Lots and lots of, you know, great talent and a great show. And it was televised. Uh, it, you know, it grew inevitably. It wasn't always, you know, basically everyone ignored us, uh, especially the music industry until on our first, our very first show, Lionel Richie agreed to play, oh, which wow. gave us made a noise. And almost better than that for the UK record industry, the then leader of the opposition, Tony Blair, who later became prime minister, he attended. And that put us on the map. Suddenly, <laughs> yeah, we got lots of media attention. That was our very first year as well. So, um, you know, because at the time, record companies sent like their PA because it was a black thing. They had to be supporting it supposedly. But, you know, like the secretary would come, etc. There was no kind of movers or shakers in the industry for the first year. But obviously supported by the black community and the black, you know, artists. But uh, that changed. That changed pretty damn quickly. And it just grew and grew. So from a small kind of, a hotel dining room uh we went to in no time at all 98 we were in the royal albert hall and that's um, fantastic yeah it really was that was a great show actually 98 that was p diddy but anyway um so uh it was just a lot of fun as well you know the music was great the show was great uh and as I say, it was annual. Very different from daily BBC News because you don't get <laughs> yeah. anything wrong, you can imagine. There's no, oh, well, don't matter if it gets, goes wrong. It's like you don't get anything wrong. So the adrenaline is there, but it's unfortunately concentrated in that short space of time. So, you know, for days before the show, you're not sleeping, you're busy, you know, you're having 8 a.m. meetings and mm -hmm. then you're, you know, having 
look, 8 a.m. doesn't sound early for Americans, I don't think, but it is for me. Um, <laughs> so, definitely, yeah. early. definitely early for me, definitely early for me. Yeah, I mean, literally, you're just working straight through flat out and for the last week, there isn't a lot of sleep and there isn't a lot of, um, you know, there's just no possibility that you're going to get it wrong. You know, we used to, we'd go out live on BBC, or we did for the last few years. We didn't. We were on Channel 4 for previous years. Most of the years I was involved, as I say, 2010 was the last one I did. That was the last sort of TV I did. Actually, that's not true. I got a really plum job the next year, which was for Oprah Winfrey. Oh, nice. Really fantastic. She was gorgeous. I, you know, you always worry that people aren't going to live up to expectations. She certainly mm -hmm. did. Yeah, she was doing a new series for, own, you know, her own network. And mm -hmm. uh, the first episode was from London. So I was the producer on that, which was really good. Really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you so much for your efforts in this area. I mean, yes. it's incredible. You've been involved in so many things and you've been a supporter and just, I can see why the ladies love you so much. <laughs> well, and it was so funny because we, we said this before the show, right? And you might recognize Gazella Rowe because she was the 2019 face of the 25 Hottest Indie Authors, Artists and Advocate magazine. And she says, ladies, what do you want me to talk about? And we were like, your life. <laughs> because your life is amazing. Well, it's been pretty long, certainly longer than any of yours. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's been, but it's been a long and eventful life because I mean, there are a lot of people that have right, lives. they have certainly not them. wasted the same thing every day. They literally ate the same thing for breakfast, but yours has been eventful. <laughs> yeah, but everybody wastes, unfortunately, you can't help it, can you? You know, we all kind of waste sometimes our time, our energy. Uh, it's a hor it's horrible. I hate waste of any sort. I'm one of those people that eats everything on my plate, like nothing is left, <laughs> but um. I was gonna say, mentioning okay. that if she have, if you ever get the chance for her to cook for you, you will want to eat everything. Everything. <laughs> and like, and like many, many plates later. It was six plates that I, had I know it was six plates later, and I was trying to act like I was like, trying to be decent and try not and act like a human being, but I was going to go for the seven. But I was like, and, and then I, I looked at her and I was like, "Don't you do it? <laughs> Don't you do <laughs> it? Don't it? Don't you do it?" <laughs> yeah. Oh, you guys are so sweet. <laughs> All right, so we probably wrap yeah, we'll probably wrap this up. Um, where can people listen to your show and like get involved? Maybe even call you, up, maybe even get you to read some of the audiobooks. Yeah, I mean, audiobookradio.net is definitely the first port of call. Uh, the second would be deadtreepublishing.com, which is our website where we have all the audiobooks that we do. Um, in fact, we did, I didn't tell you. Um, did two interesting ones for international women's day we did uh, 60 women that changed the word and that was really good i mean there were so many strong poems in that and then earlier this year at the beginning of the year we did uh, black words matter and i did so much research on that i really did and we've got it starts in 1720 they're all african-american poets and it was just like some of them, you put the name into Google and nothing comes up. Mm. It was that kind of intensive research where I couldn't Google things. And even, I mean, obviously there's some really well known, like, you know, there's Phyllis Wheatley and there's, um, you know, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And we go into the Harlem Renaissance. That's where we end. But in the sort of 18th and 19th century, we found some really good African-American poems and poets and ones that aren't well known so really proud of that anyway that's um you could you can hear five minute episode or uh, five minute samples on every single volume which you know if you don't want to buy anything that's okay because it's sometimes five minutes gets you quite a lot and there are so many volumes to choose from we have done countless volumes of poetry a lot of poetry anthologies yeah so, yeah, audiobookradio.net and deadtreepublishing.com. Uh, definitely would welcome if people have ideas and already, ideally, even better when they already have audio, 
people who have pod regular podcasts who are looking for other platforms to broadcast on. Yep. But have always, please, you know, look at the schedule, have a listen to the station. The quality is pretty high and the um, content is brilliant. So, but, you know, we'd like obviously people to get in touch, but they have to sort of recognize that it should be. I mean, it doesn't have to be a good fit in terms of, you know, we're always willing to take chances. And even if it's content that we haven't already got and something, you know, quite different from what we're doing, that's actually could be a good thing, you know. So it's, but yeah, have a listen. So when, when you say a good fit, you just mean quality wise, right? You know, quality it has to be good. You know, obviously we're broadcasting. Though these days, I mean, to be honest, the quality on this phone, I would quite happily broadcast that on our station. So I don't mean it has to be, you know, like a sound engineer's dream. I just, <laughs> um, you know, so it's not the technical quality. But, you know, it's important that there's some good ideas there and that, you know, there's a good exchange or there's good feeling. It's I'm important. wondering why she's like, the quality should be good. Actually, I learned this in audio class that when someone listens to something, they're more unforgiving to what they hear than what they see. So if you make a mistake in a movie, no one, people will see it. But they're normally just gonna skip over it. But if you make a mistake in your audio, people are like, what? No. Because yeah. I don't have the visual to distract them. <laughs> totally. That's really wise words. That's really true. That is so true. And I always used to get frustrated in, um, you know, when I was working behind the camera that, you know, everybody, every director, everybody makes allowances for the cameraman to do this and he's got to do that and we can't have that. And then the poor sound man, it's just kind of like, oh yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah, just just stick a mic on, you know? And it's actually, well, no, it's not fine because you've now put this person in a situation that though the river looks beautiful, the noise is being picked up, we can't hear him, you know? But I agree, people don't notice when there's visuals, but I just feel mistakes on radio or audio, I kind of, I can live with that. I think if the ideas, if it's, if it's interesting, doesn't matter. I'm not that kind of perfectionist. Thank you so much for coming on, Gazella. I mean, finally, we did it. Like, after, five five, years. after five years, we finally did it. And we're so thankful <laughs> to come on. We really appreciate it. Tanya, where can people find out more about you? I'm across social media at Ms. Tanya Todd. My website is MsTanyaTodd.com. You can find my podcast on YouTube and Spotify. That's the 52 Love Podcast. And IMDb, just search for Tanya Todd. Tanya, can I just check with that? Is that T-O-N-Y-A-T-O-D? That is correct. Perfect. Okay. I love that. <laughs> I, love I love it. Just in case you're on the podcast, you don't know how to spell it. There you go. Now you know. <laughs> you can find out everything your ladies are doing on www.andwethought.com. You can check out more episodes on the Ladies Tale Podcast since you're here right now. So go ahead and check out some more episodes. And more importantly, than all of that, remember to go to the Ladies Tab, go to the middle and see the charities that we probably support. And you can support them also. And if you just want all of this in a abbreviated one-page website, where do you go to? www.andithoughtladies.com. Absolutely. And y'all remember, wisdom is all around you if you're open to finding it and accepting it. So peace and love, you guys, from Will No No and Jade. Bye-bye. Oh, yeah, thanks for listening.